Okay, we're here with Doug Berger. Doug, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at Microsoft. I'm a researcher in uh, Microsoft Research Technologies Division, the new division that was just formed. Mm -hmm. so I'm a processor architect by training. I was at the University of Texas on the faculty for 10 years before moving to Microsoft in 2008, where I built advanced processors and new architectures. And how did you get into uh, computing and programming? What, what was your first computer? Well, when I was seven, eight, nine-ish, my uh, dad was a professor at Smith College, and he brought home a, a, a CRT monitor and a modem where you plug the handset into the, the foam pads and we could connect yeah. to the, the VAX at UMass, uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And nice. so we hooked up and I started playing games and uh, you know, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, and then uh, started writing programs. So tell me more about your team at MSR. Uh, there's uh, some work that you've done around data centers, and that's what we want to focus on today. Tell us about sure. that work and, and what, what you've done. Well, the first thing I, I have to say is that I'm almost embarrassed to be interviewed about this work because so much of uh, the innovation and the ideas and the hard sweat was done by my team. Mm -hmm. uh, the team is its one of the best teams in the hardware business. The, the set of people is absolutely amazing. Uh, they really are a ninja team and they, you know, we all are on this shared mission together. Uh, so they work really hard, they're brilliant, they're much smarter than I am. Uh, you know, they're just, they're a phenomenal team. And, and I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit today, but what they've pulled off is amazing. Okay. It's really disruptive, and it's a testament to the team that they were able to succeed. And how does that impact felt around, around the industry? Let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what you've worked on here. Um, uh, what, what is the impact that it, it's made? It's a platform for accelerating data center services. And so uh, up until now, data centers have been typically built with servers, with processors, CPUs, and memory, and network, and flash, and disks. Uh, there haven't been a lot of specialized accelerators put in because you really want, you really want all of the servers in your data center to be as similar as possible, yeah. and Microsoft has moved in that direction. Mm -hmm. so that your services can run across you know, many servers as opposed to being stuck in one corner. Uh, you know, if, you, if, if that service grows faster than you anticipate and the, the, the servers aren't the same, you're, you're kind of stuck. Or you might buy too many servers. And so what we've done is created a programmable hardware platform based on FPGAs and put it into a large number of servers as a pilot and showed that yes, you can actually do this. You can put these hardware accelerators in and, and accelerate many diverse services with them. So let's start there. What is an FPGA for someone who doesn't know? Which so would probably be a lot of people. So an FPGA, it stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And you can think of it as a, as a chip that can be, where the, the, the hardware can be changed on the fly mm -hmm. in a few seconds, typically. And the, the core idea is rather than burning in the circuits as transistors with polygons, you know, if you want to make, say, a, a chain of AND gates yeah. on a chip, you know, typically what you'll do is you'll create a mask and you use photolithography light to, to etch down you know, some polygons on the chip that form those AND gates out of transistors. And it's a one-time endeavor. It's a one-time endeavor. You, you, you burn it and, and it's there and it's never going to change. Yeah. What an FPGA does is they put a lot of little, little memory blocks on the chip that are all networked together. And those memory, those memory blocks will hold a little bit of state that allows you to put in some inputs and the state says, what's the logic function in them? And then the outputs represent that logic function. Okay, so I, I program the ands and ors in that little table by setting the bits in it appropriately so that I get the right output. So it's, it's programmable logic. And for these chips, do you program them for the data center or are they per application? So they're per application. What, what FPGAs have traditionally been used for is prototyping uh, ASICs or, or custom chips. Mm -hmm. So you have a design, you do the design, you want to test it out in FPGA first to make sure it's right before you go and spend millions of dollars to have the chip manufactured. Yeah. And you know, they run much faster than software because they really are, you know, they really are running in hardware. I mean, the lookup tables are slower than raw gates, but only about 10x. Mm -hmm. You know, software is 100 to 1,000x slower yeah. to simulate a, a chip. And so you can run very rapidly. And then FPGAs, as they've gotten larger and larger, they've been used in more and more things. Uh, they're used heavily in networking gear, telecom gear, network switches. Mm -hmm. Uh, but until now, they haven't been widely used in a data center. And what is the problem that you were trying to solve with the data center? Is it a, a speed issue? 
Are, are you trying to speed things up in the data center, or, or what, uh, what solution does this uh, solve? Well, it's speed, power, and cost. So what we've seen over the past few years is that the performance of individual microprocessors, especially server processors, but also in the clients as well, has started to cap off. You know, we don't see yeah. clock rates growing very much faster anymore. Uh, the, the chips aren't getting nearly as energy efficient per transistor as they used to. Mm -hmm. This is all the challenges we face with silicon scaling. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's my belief, and, and some of my colleagues share my view, that the number of cores that we're starting to see you know, the growth in the rate of core counts is starting to slow down too, or yeah. imminently will be slowing down. So this is the curve of Moore's Law. And yes. And you're saying that Moore's Law uh, may not be the constant that it uh, had been believed to be. Right. Um, and that uh, it may plateau in the near future. Right. So, and, and what does that mean for computing? Well, Moore's Law was defined by Gordon Moore in a publication, a really short one, you know, three or four pages yeah. in 1965. And he really talked about the number of transistors per chip mm -hmm. was going to double every 18 months to two years. Yeah. And that really held true for 50 years. It's yeah. amazing. A 50-year exponential is a long time yeah. for doubling every, you know, within a, within a couple of years. Um, now, there was something else called Denard scaling that Bob Denard, who was the inventor of DRAM, mm -hmm. uh, defined in a paper in 1974 from IBM, and that he gave the rules for how you shrink transistors on a regular cadence. Yeah. And Denard scaling, the, the way he specified it, uh, was such that each time you shrink the transistors, you shrink the channel length, the gate oxide width, the channel doping concentration, the doping atoms in there, mm -hmm. uh, the voltage, all of it would be scaled proportionally. And when you did that, you'd get a reduction in power, the transistor would go much faster, and it would be much smaller. So it was like magic. Yeah. And that ran for 40 years. Denard scaling failed uh, around the mid-2000s, 2005, because the, the insulator on the transistor started to get so thin that you couldn't shrink it anymore mm -hmm. without lots of electrons flowing across and leaking. Yeah. And so that, that, that's really why we saw this, this big pivot from frequency scaling to multi-core. Mm -hmm. And so now we've, we've had these stresses and this power crisis grow and grow. Um, now we're starting to see real challenges on Moore's Law itself. And you know the transistors used to get cheaper because they'd be doubling for the same, every generation for, for effectively the same price. Yeah. And we're now starting to see that flatten out as well. Yeah. So sometime between now uh, and I'd say the next five years, mm -hmm. we're going to hit an economic end to Moore's Law and transistors are going to stop getting cheaper and at some point it won't be economic to make smaller transistors, and then we'll see a hard stop. And the implications for the industry are really, really strong. And uh, talk about the implications. What does that mean, that uh, hardware just won't come down in price like it had in the past? Well, it certainly won't come down as fast, but what it means is if you're a, if you're a semiconductor manufacturer and you've been offering a chip, a product, that every generation you double the number of transistors, which allows you to add a lot more functionality mm -hmm. and run the thing at the same power, despite the doubling of transistors and the extra functionality, and sell it for, say, $100. Uh, now, if you want to double the transistors, if the transistor cost is flattened, you'll have to sell it for $200. Yeah. And that really breaks the economics of a lot of these businesses, and it will really change people's business models. Uh, and so we will see, we're already seeing that pressure. Mm -hmm. you know, we're already seeing the, the cost improvements flatten out, and so we're starting to see pricing pressure, but that pressure hasn't gotten strong enough to terminate the silicon scaling. Yeah. I mean, once that terminates, I think if you're a, if you're a silicon manufacturer, you have to move to a different business model for the most part. So uh, talk about the impact that the FPGA will have on uh, Moore's Law. Is it something that will extend this a little bit? It gives us a little bit of breathing room in the meantime? I would say that, that you know, an FPGA can accelerate uh, software when you move something in and if it's a, an amenable workload by about 100x. Yeah. ASICs, you know, are typically 1,000x mm -hmm. uh, in terms of performance per joule. Uh, FPGAs are about 100x. And so, I mean, what that means is that if we are able to deploy this programmable hardware in our cloud, we will be able to start moving workloads over. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I should emphasize here that this is still a research project. Sure. You know, this is, I think, our goal as researchers is to try to shift the industry. Um, but, but when you have a lot of programmable logic in your cloud, it's a target where you can start migrating services over. Each time you do, you might get 10x, 20x, mm -hmm. tune it some more, get 100x. And as you move more and more services over, you get more and more efficiency. Sure. So even if uh, Moore's Law stops, or even if, even if Moore's Law keeps going, but for cost reasons, our, our CPUs aren't getting that much faster, yeah. 
okay, this gives us a scaling path yeah, yeah. Uh, for some number of years. We can keep improving the performance of our services. We can keep improving the quality of our services running at larger scale. Mm -hmm. We can improve the efficiency of our services, the cost of our services, well past the end of Moore's Law. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, some of the collaboration you've had with the Bing team. So when we started this project uh, back in 2000, early 2011, uh, Jim Laris and I, and Jim has since left Microsoft uh, to take a prestigious position elsewhere, and Andrew Putnam, who's on my team now and is our hardware guru, uh, got together and we said, let's, let's think about what we could do to really change the, you know, change the game for Bing, mm -hmm. uh, give them a big jump in efficiency for, for search. And so we met with Bing leadership uh, in January of that year, and they said, this looks really interesting, could be disruptive. I mean, it's a little crazy, uh, but, you know, programmable hardware in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like a, an interesting opportunity, and if you can get the efficiencies that are possible, it would be really great for them. Yeah. Really great for us. From, uh, and so uh, we started building a prototype. And I have to say, Bing, throughout this entire process, has been simply wonderful. I mean, they've given us a lot of consulting early on, you know, giving, sort of guiding us on what would be feasible for them, design requirements. They put in a lot of time. Um, later on, they uh, started partnering with us. Uh, you know, Bing software engineers spent a lot of time working through the interfaces, the APIs. They hired an amazing guy named Derek Chu, uh, who is the lead hardware, leads a, a hardware team in Bing to support this effort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they've really put a lot of skin in the game and been partners. And I think uh, Sidaram Lanka, who runs the IndexServe platform team, uh, has been simply amazing. I mean, he's a brilliant engineer, he's open-minded, he's willing to take risks, but he's conservative because he has to deliver. Uh, you know, just the, the sort of person you really want to have working at Microsoft. And so the Bing team throughout this has been, I think, conservative because they have to deliver working solutions, sure. but aggressive in that they're open-minded and willing to try, try really interesting things. And it's just, it's phenomenal to see uh, to see how uh, you can balance that aggressiveness and conservatism and really try to jump out into a technology leadership position while ensuring that your stuff will work at scale. And what does Catapult afford the Bing uh, development team that they couldn't do before? Well, it really does two things. So in the ranking engine, we moved, I would say, a significant portion of the compute heavy part of page ranking, which is uh, for search engines is, you know, when you have a document or a query and you want to decide which documents you, re you return in what order, mm -hmm. you know, you'll, assign, you'll take some subset of them that look like the promising candidates, you'll rank them, you'll assign them each a score, then you sort the order and that's the, sort, sort that list and that's the order in which you return them. Mm -hmm. And that is an enormously computationally heavy task. Yeah. I mean, both, both uh, our competitors and Bing do massive amounts of computation on each page to figure out is it a good response for this query. Mm -hmm. And so uh, by moving most of that into FPGAs, Bing has shown that they're able to uh, run larger models, potentially, uh, within the time they have to score the documents. And they can also run higher throughput so they can do this with more servers. Mm -hmm. So it saves Bing money. They can get potentially better results. It saves energy, you know, better for the environment. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at, we think, affordable cost. And what are the next steps for Catapult? So Bing has uh, worked with us on this pilot. You know, we, we, we deploy, we brought up their ranking engine on our hardware on a bed of 1,600 servers, actually 1,632 servers to be precise. So we had the hard, hardware manufactured, we deployed it in that bed of servers, uh, and then we so worked. This was all custom hardware that you were working with. Well, we built custom hardware, put it in our servers, so mm -hmm. it was designed to be compatible and fit in there cleanly. Yeah. Uh, we had a little tight spot in the back to fit it. Mm -hmm. uh, the servers are very dense. And then we worked closely with Bing to bring up their, their software uh, stack on these servers, offloading the part of ranking that we had ported on the programmable hardware. Yeah. And so uh, the results we report in the paper are that we just about doubled the throughput uh, by adding this accelerator with the potential to run better models. So, so right off the bat, you can run with half the number of servers, and we think there's a lot more gains to be had. So if someone wanted to get into this area w working with uh, uh, FPGAs, what, what language do you typically use and uh, what are the, the technologies behind it that people should look into? So right now, today, 
uh, much of the FPGA programming is done with, with uh, things that are called HDLs for hardware description languages. Mm -hmm. These are VHDL or Verilog. And they're, they're basically concurrent programming languages where every function is being evaluated all the time uh, with regular synchronization intervals, which are the clocks on the mm -hmm. chip, uh, determining, okay, now it's time to do the next evaluation. So you can think of these as large numbers of concurrent modules uh, with well-defined communication interfaces, FIFOs, latches between them. Yeah. And so every, every cycle of the clock, you evaluate all of the logic. So it's very, it's very much a fine-grained parallel programming uh, language. And then increasingly, because these chips are getting more and more pervasive uh, in, in many sectors, uh, people are writing stacks now uh, that will target domain-specific languages or, um, you know, or concurrent programming languages more at the software level that can be automatically translated down to the hardware description languages. That's great. Well, I look forward to what you have coming up next. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks.